Well, what's up, Connection Boy? Come on, let's get on our feet. We're going to worship Jesus in the house of the Lord today. Come on, let's sing this out. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Sing 
down a tree There on a tree Mercy for King Broken and shame For all to see The Father lay down His mind Yes He did trust you as we sing this together. With every breath I stand on my lungs, my heart cries out, you belong to the glory. Through every law. take your communion elements out. We'll take those together in just a moment. You know, I've been thinking a lot about lately about inner peace and joy, how you find it, how you keep it. You know, I think so many times we look for that in so many different places, maybe our jobs, maybe relationships, success, whatever that is to us. And oftentimes when we get to whatever we think is going to give us that peace and joy, often it doesn't. You know, I've been marinating on Philippians 4 lately where it talks about that God gives us the peace that surpasses all understanding. And I have to be honest, when I feel like I 100% trust in God, I feel like those days I have peace and joy. And on those days where I'm halfway, actually I, I'm pretty anxious. And Jesus fully committed his love for us so that we could have peace and joy by his death on the cross. And so today as we take communion, the prayer would be that all of us fully, 100%, trust in Jesus. Let's take our communion elements. Let's take the bread. The bread represents Jesus' body 
that was broken for us. Let's take that together. Let's take the cup. The cup represents his blood that was shed for us. Let's take that together. Will you please close your eyes with me? Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being fully committed with your love for us so that we can have peace and joy. And Jesus, today, I pray that we fully trust you, whatever's going on in our lives. God, that we fully trust you so that we can have that inner peace and that joy that only you can bring. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Marriage involves two people. They meet. You found me really attractive, really quickly. <laughs> they fall in love. She's passionate. <laughs> they get married and embark on a relationship that's designed to be one of increasing intimacy. I really couldn't see my life without her. But that's not automatic. We have to keep working at our marriage. Because I wasn't getting much affirmation, I started getting that from other places. Our marriage was nearly over. If you start building good habits in your relationship, you'll be reaping the effects of those choices in 5, 10 or 20 years' time. I can't let my past define my future. We have to build our own reality. The aim of the marriage course is to strengthen the connection between you as a couple. Love grows us. This is not a silly sentimental idea. This is science fact. How about one that we don't really hear about? How about this one? Fun. Marriage ought to be fun. If you're not having fun, what's the point? The marriage course is built on universal principles that are relevant to any couple anywhere. In years to come, you'll look back on having built a marriage as perhaps the most important achievement of all in your lives. All right, good morning. Welcome over in Avon. Hey, I do want to let you know how excited I am about this marriage course. It's seven weeks. It meets in the evenings. I think it's Wednesday night. You can get all the info there at cp.news. Men, this is the cheapest Valentine's date you can get. I don't know if you're like me. Uh, sometimes at church things, you sit at a round table and you have to talk to strangers and maybe, you, maybe you're a little weirded off by that. I want you to know at the marriage course, the only person you have to talk to if you sign up or if you get dragged there by your spouse, the only person you have to talk to is your spouse. Uh, it's seven weeks. You're essentially getting hundreds of dollars worth of professional counseling. And whether your marriage is in emergency mode or it's doing great and you want to tune up, you will benefit from this. It's our first time doing this course as a church, and I'm so excited about it. Many of my pastor friends have told me just how much it's helped them in their marriages and so many people in their church. So uh, whether you're at Avon or here at Brownsburg, we'd love to have you join us. It will be at the Brownsburg location. Hey, it's Baptism Sunday, and I just want to celebrate something. There are nine scheduled baptisms over at Avon. Can we just celebrate that together? Way to go, Avon. <laughs> it is awesome to see what God is doing at that location. Uh, he's truly working miracles. Well, we're in this series called Start Fresh. And I'll start fresh by telling you a story that you're welcome to laugh at me. It's from my childhood. I was the youngest. I was scrawny. I was sickly. I was all these weird things. But I loved candy like all kids. And my favorite flavor was vanilla. You know, like with Tootsie Rolls, there's the classic Tootsie Roll, which is chocolate. But there are Tootsie Rolls that come in a blue wrapper, and the Tootsie Roll is white. That's a vanilla Tootsie Roll. That was like my favorite flavor. Well, one day my mom was baking, and I saw this bottle that looked like this. It said, pure vanilla. <laughs> and I schemed in my little mind. I thought, when mom's not looking, I'm going to just drink that bottle. It looks so good. So I don't remember what my age was, but I was small enough that I had to climb up onto the lower kitchen counter and stand up to open the upper cupboard. It was so, you know, probably six or younger. And I'm up there, and I find this bottle, and I, you know, pull the lid off, and I take a swig. Well, let me tell you, if you've never tasted pure vanilla extract, it's actually very bitter. I don't know exactly what I looked like in the moment, uh, but it might have been something like these kids in this video. Feel free to laugh along. Thank you. Yes, sir. And you guys have a wonderful Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 
<ride> Prendere tutta la faccia. Aspetta, guarda. <ride> Do you like it? A lot? Do you really, do you, do you really like it? I, I love the one where the little girl, it must be something her mom had made because her mom's like, do you like it? And she's like, yeah. Yeah, I do. I like it. It's great. You know, life can be a little bit like that, can't it? Uh, we embark on something that we're sure will be sweet, the person we fall in love with, and now we're going to get married. We're going to have this dream life. And somehow after a few years uh, or maybe a few months, it just doesn't taste like what you thought it would be. Or there's this dream job, and maybe you get further education, and you make all these sacrifices, and you... You do everything to get that sweet job, and the toll that it takes on you is just bitter. I don't know if you can relate to that feeling in any area of your life, seasons of chronic illness, where, you know, we thought, boy, I, I, you know, we got all these other things working in our life. I didn't think we'd have to deal with sickness. Today, we're going to talk about when life is bitter, what can you do when your expectations are unmet? Or worse, when the taste in your mouth is just sour and unpleasant, what can you do? Because we all inevitably have bitter seasons, distasteful, sour seasons in our lives. So what can we do with them? Well, God speaks to this, and I want to encourage you right now to open your heart to hear from him today. It's actually a true story in the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, and it's following an emotional high where God has done this miracle, maybe you've heard of it, where he parted the Red Sea miraculously. Uh, God's people had been slaves in Egypt. God does all these uh, miraculous plagues to loosen Pharaoh's grip, and he lets the Israelite people go. Then he changes his mind. He sends his army after them. And for the Jewish people, there's a mountain on one side, a mountain on the other side, a giant sea, the Red Sea, in front of them, and Pharaoh's army behind them. And in that moment of crisis, they call out to God, and God uses a godly leader to do a miracle and miraculously parts the Red Sea God's people pass through. Verse 22, when Moses led Israel from the Red Sea and they went into the desert of Shur, for three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. Now these people live in a dry climate, they had packed some stuff with them. They've got animals. They've got some wealth from the Egyptians. They've surely got some leather or uh, pottery-type canteens with them. But after a couple days, people are sharing the water. The water runs out. They're looking for water. There is no water. Now, I want you to just emotionalize what this must have been like. Uh, perhaps as many as a million people. You've got babies. You've got grandmas and grandpas. You've got all these people, and there's no water. This is a, a real need. It's a felt need, and it's a basic need, and it's unmet. Well, as they're out there, you can imagine this massive group, some of the perhaps younger ones who are sort of running ahead to scout report they found a small pool of water. It's not a mirage and so the whole nation moves in that direction. And you can just imagine the emotion of seeing glimmering water, thinking, oh, maybe it's a mirage. Then you get there. It's actually real water. But as you're approaching, you start to hear these groans and these moans from the people ahead of you who got there first. And the report comes back. The water is bitter. It's undrinkable. Yeah, the taste is brackish, most likely. It's just, it's clearly, it's not healthy, but not only that, you can't even get it down. I mean, what a letdown. What a disappointment. 
And I find it such a, a fitting story because in our lives, we all have moments of similar disappointment where we, we just needed the one thing to fall into place. And there's a doctor who says, maybe this treatment will work and you place your hope in it. And then it doesn't. Or, or finally, the person's gonna kind of do their part in the relationship and then they don't. Exodus 15, verse 24, the people responded the way that we typically do. They grumbled. Who can we blame for our pain? So they pick Moses because he was the leader. You let us out here. What are we supposed to drink? Can you imagine being Moses in this moment? You're just trying to obey God. You're following God. And now you've got a million people, and they're not like typing angry things about you from a distance. They're right in front of you. They're surrounding you, and they're mad. This is a mob of angry people, and they're blaming Moses. What does Moses do? Verse 25, then Moses cried out to the Lord. Now, these seven words are going to change everything in this story and I just want to invite you right now, wherever something is bitter in your life, cry out to the Lord. I've been in church for quite a while now. I'm actually a pastor. And there are still times in my life when things get bitter and I grumble about it and I moan about it and I complain about it to myself and my spouse and my inner circle. And I actually haven't prayed about it. And not only prayed, but cried out, God Help. God, only you could fix this situation. Times where I'll, I'll get sick and I'll be whining, you know, why am I sick? And then I realize after two days, I haven't even asked God to heal me yet. I haven't really cried out. Have you really cried out to God about whatever it is that's bitter in your life? And wherever you are in your journey, maybe you've never prayed a prayer before, or maybe you've been in church for 50 years, I believe we can all take one step closer of really verbalizing our needs to the creator of the universe, believing that he actually wants to meet our needs. Verse 25, Moses cries out to the Lord, and the Lord responds. Now, it's not in the way that you'd expect, because God shows Moses, the, the Hebrew word is tree. He shows Moses a tree. Maybe it's a fallen down tree or it's a branch from a tree. It's a big piece of wood. And, and it's like, toss this tree into the water. Well, oh God, that makes no sense at all. Do you understand filtration? Or, you know, like, this, this is just going to add more debris in the water. This makes no sense. But God clearly shows Moses what to do. And what makes Moses a hero of the faith is not that he was perfect. He failed many times. It's that consistently when God would show him what to do, he would do it, even if it didn't make sense. And that, as you cry out to God, part of crying out is saying, God, what do I do with my pain? What do I do with this relationship? What do I do with my finances, my career, my child, my inner peace? What do I do? And you listen and we have the advantage of having 66 books of Scripture in the Bible, and he speaks, and then you obey, even if it doesn't make sense. And after you obey, look at this. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. This is not a coincidence. This is not a scientific technique. This is a miracle where God defies the laws of nature, which he created, to flex his muscles and to show his presence. And, and the Hebrew word here, fit to drink, literally means sweet. So God takes a bitter thing that no one else and nothing else in all the universe could make sweet for a million people to drink, and, and through an act of obedience, which is just faith expressed, he does this miracle. He turns a bitter thing sweet. So how could you see the bitter thing in your life turns sweet? Well, only God, there are certain things that only God can take that bitterness, that injustice, the, the thing that you've been through that's just unfair, it's not right, there's no other way. Only God can take that 
and turn it into something sweet. But I want to encourage you. I believe he brought you into this moment. He's teaching you from his word because he wants you to know he's eager to do this. This is actually what he specializes in. You know, you think about what it takes to to build a magnificent building versus what it takes to tear one down. Satan is a powerful force in our universe and in our world. Satan and all of the unseen demonic realm. We see them destroying marriages, destroying life, destroying cultures and civilizations. They have great power to destroy. But God's power is far greater. He's a God who creates. Not only is he a God who creates, he's a God who recreates, who redeems, who takes what Satan has made bitter, what Satan has twisted for evil, and he turns it for good, and he brings sweetness out of the most impossible situations. And I just want to encourage you today to open up your heart to having a faith in God that says, God, I believe that's who you are. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't tasted it yet but I believe that's who you are. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Bring him your bitter things and invite him to flex his muscles. Invite him to show you how he can recreate and redeem. Well, how did that happen for Moses? How can it happen for you? I'm going to give you seven ways from this true story, seven ways that you can see God turn the vinegar, bitter, crab apple the tastes of your life into something sweet. And the first we've covered is to cry out to the Lord. But I, I, wanna, I want you to not just read that as a Christian cliche. I want you to actually think about your situation. How much have you really cried out to the Lord? The inherent in the language there, when Moses cries out to God, it's not like, uh, Lord, you know, if it's your will, could you maybe help me. It's a lot more like, help! (laughs) Like, God, I have no other, I have no other way through this except you. Have you really cried out to the Lord? It's interesting, we don't know the exact number, but there's about a million people, and 999,999 of them do what humans do, which is, who's the fall guy? And the bigger fall guy who can fall from the highest to the furthest, the better, because we want justice, we want revenge, and that's what humans do. And it takes an actual faith in God to say, yeah, I'm called to live at this horizontal human level and to love people, but my real hope for justice is always from above. My real hope for help is always from above. And I'm actually going to cry out to the God of the universe, believing that he alone can bring sweetness from my bitter situation. Second, when your life is bitter, submit your life to him. Step one, you cry out to him. Then whatever he tells you to do, do it. That's actually a quote. That's what Mary, the mother of Jesus, said when he performed his first miracle. What did he do? He took water and he turned it into sweet wine. And the reason it happened is that his mom said, whatever he says to do, do it. And he says, hey, take these huge ritual uh, containers of water and just fill them all up with water. Made no sense. Fill them with water, set them there, and it'll turn to wine. And, And it did. But those people had to fill up those containers. What is it that it God is just waiting to turn something sweet in your life, but you've gotta you've gotta just simply obey. You've gotta throw the branch into the rancid lake. You've got to fill the pot with water. You've just got to submit yourself. Now, when this story happened with Moses, none of the Bible was written yet. We now have a lot of it written down. And there are so many things that as you start to say, God, I want your way in my life, I mean, there's dozens of things to start doing. And and you're here to learn those things. And as you get in community and in relationships, whether it's the marriage course or a small group or a men's group or a women's Bible study, uh, part of our way of life of following Jesus is, I want to learn everything he says about how to live life. And so you cry out to him and you submit your life to him and then you see him show up. Verse 25, after God does this miracle, he's going to say something important to the people. Now, this is the third miracle that he's done for them. 
probably more than three technically, but let's group all the things that he did to Pharaoh and Egypt. Let's just call that one. Even though it's more than one. And then he parts the Red Sea. And now they're thirsty and he miraculously provides water. He's done three miracles, but these people spiritually right now are kind of like spiritual infants. And God's like a parent who's just, he's feeding them, but they're not really growing a lot because he's just doing everything for them. Imagine parenting, and well, this happens, right? There's parents who do everything for their kids. And those kids grow up and they cannot stand on their own two feet. And God's a, he's a good parent. He lets us fall on our face a little bit. He always picks us up. He always helps us. Here's what God knows. It was one thing to walk through a Red Sea that has been miraculously parted. It's going to be another to walk into the territory of the Philistines, all these other nations who have fortifications and claim the promised land. God's people are going to have to grow from a faith that's down here to a faith that's up here. And he allows them to encounter this bitter water so they can take a stair step of faith. And then they're going to take another stair step and another stair step. And by the way, he does the same thing in our lives. Here's what he does if you don't take the step. You take a lap around the desert and you come back to the same step again. Will you, will you take the step this time? No? Okay, I'm just going to let you go through that again. You've gotten fired from four different jobs for the same thing. God's waiting for you to take the step and learn that lesson, and then he'll have another step and another step. So it's interesting. He pretty much tells them this. He says, these are some you know, powerful words. He issues a ruling to instruct them, and he puts them to the test. This is after the miracle. I want you guys to grow in your faith. And here's what that's going to look like. If you listen carefully to me, God's speaking, if you do what's right in my eyes, the Lord says, if you pay attention to my commands. So we're getting all these ifs. And what this means is this is a promise from God or a covenant that is conditional, a conditional promise. Now, uh, we all have conditional promises in our lives. Sometimes when God gives us a conditional promise, we can be a little bit like spoiled kids, or at least I can. I can be like, well, why do you need so much from me? If you love me unconditionally, why don't you just do it for me? Well, he's already just given you salvation for free. All you got to do is receive it. He's done the big things for you, but like a good parent, he's going to teach you to walk. He's going to teach you to have some faith. And he pretty much says to the Israelites, you don't have to be perfect. I'm not saying if you're perfect, then I'll do all these things for you, but if you listen to my word, you really, you strive to live according to my plan for your life. If you do that, then I will not bring on you any of the diseases that I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Now, if, if you're pushing away a little bit at like, wow, why does God have these conditional promises? Well, first of all, he can do whatever he wants. He created us. But secondly, I think if we step outside of religion, spirituality, the Bible, God, if we're honest with ourselves, we live in a world of conditional promises that we're very comfortable with. Every mortgage is a conditional promise. As long as you make these payments every month, if you make these payments, then you can live in this house. Or if you pay rent, then you can live here. Or if you pay your car payment, you can have your car. What happens if you don't pay your car payment? The repo man comes. Back when I was a journalist, I did a ride along with a repo man. Those guys keep guns under their seats because people freak out. They're like, you're taking my car. It's not your car. You haven't paid for it. We're used to conditional promises. If you buy an airplane ticket and then you don't show up to the flight, do you have a right to be really upset that that they didn't take you where they were going to take you. No, it's conditional. You have to be here at the departure time. We live in a world of conditional promises. Now, God's love for you is unconditional. He's going to love you no matter what. But just like a parent loves a child unconditionally, but they're going to say, hey, if you want this device, then you're going to have to do your chores because I'm teaching you responsibility. That's not mean. That's responsible. That's mature. That's good. And God gives us some if-then conditional promises in Scripture. I will heal you 
as you look to me, as you call out to me, as you live my way of life. And, and God introduces here in the original language a proper name for himself. In this phrase, I am the Lord who heals you. It's the name Yahweh, or some people pronounce it Jehovah, Rapha. Yahweh or Jehovah meaning the Lord, Rapha meaning who heals. God introduces, this is the first time he uses this name for himself. And what's interesting is it's not right after he heals a person physically. It's actually after he heals this water. And that's part of the point. Yes, he can heal you physically. In fact, let's look at this list. He, uh, Yahweh Rapha heals physically. He can heal you emotionally. He can heal you mentally, your mental well-being. He can heal you spiritually and relationally. But the first time God introduces this name for himself, he shows, I can heal a whole body of water in a moment. Things that are bigger than you. Things that you need that are broken, I can heal. You can experience God in these domains of your life, your body, your mind, your soul, your relationships. How will you experience him as Yahweh Rapha, as the God who heals? You'll experience him as you cry out to him, and then as you do what he says. Not perfectly, but consistently. Let me show you just a a real-life example of what this looks like, because uh, it's not always crazy, dramatic, or difficult. It's just a a way of life that says, God, when you show me my next step, I'll take it. And then when you show me my next step, I'll take it. Here's what it can look like. So coming into adulthood... I would say I was very eager to learn more about God and how to build a relationship with him and grow my faith. I just wasn't sure where to start. And it's kind of scary feeling like you're navigating that path on your own. My friends Samantha and Jason Larimore have been attending Connection Point far longer than I have. Um, They have always invited me to services with them, which I greatly appreciate because especially sometimes a church of this size can be really intimidating to walk in the front door by yourself. 2019, well, I guess it would have been probably December of 2018. Uh, My friend Samantha started asking me if I wanted to join the mini marathon training program here at Connection Point. And so we signed up together and we walked in that first night and haven't looked back since. (laughs) It's important to have accountability buddies, you know, people that are going to check on you and say, hey, You're coming to Bible study tonight, right? Or, hey, are we going out for 5 a.m. run tomorrow? You know, if I know someone is counting on me, it helps me in those times where I could easily let life get in the way. The mini marathon training running group has helped me in my faith by showing me that none of us are perfect and that we're all trying every day to live and love more like Jesus, to support and encourage each other, that we don't have to have it all figured out. Finally, it felt like a lifetime that I'd waited, but I was recently baptized in November, and that's not a path that would happen so quickly for me if it wasn't for my experience in this program and the relationships that I've developed. My biggest hope is that through what I have found in Connection Point, through, you know, what started as mini marathon training and evolved into boot camp and couch to 5K, if I can be that person that walks along somebody else 
in their difficulty and supports their faith and their relationship with God and whatever struggles they're going to, like, I just pray that God can use me like that in the future because it's, it's so valuable to have those relationships with, you know, the body of Christ, his people. There's nothing, nothing more valuable than those relationships that I've developed here. I love the emotion in her voice as she's describing what God has done in her life and, and these really miracles of life change that she's experienced and she's now eager to pass on to others. They came about very simply, I'm going to call out to God, God, I want your help in my life. I'm going to submit and that you show me a step, I can get involved in sports and fitness, I can have a running club with other believers. Oh, now I can attend services. Oh, baptism is a next step. And, and you can do the same thing. You don't have to be Moses. You just cry out to God, and you follow him, and he's eager to work in your life. A third way when your life is bitter to see God bring sweetness from it is to remind yourself that God can make a way where there is no way. In fact, this is where most miracles occur. When Jesus turned the water into wine... It was a problem. They had run out of wine. When God makes this bitter water sweet, it was a problem. Where there's, where there's a problem in your life, look for God to show up. Where there's a dead end or a broken dream, look for God to show up. Expect him to show up as you're crying out to him and submitting to him. Fourth thing to do when your life is bitter, don't forget the miracles God has done in the past. Don't forget the way he's built your faith in past miracles. I, I'm guilty often of something that I'll call spiritual amnesia. And that is, you know, I'm in the hospital. I don't know if I'm ever going to get out of the hospital. And I pray and pray and lots of other believers pray. And then God heals me and I get back to life and I'm going about life. And then some problem happens that's much smaller. And in the moment, I freak out and I think, oh, no, what are we going to do? And I forget the God who was faithful in your Red Sea, the God who delivered you from slavery, the God who's turned other bitter things in your life sweet, he will always be faithful. He will show up. Fifth thing, when your life is bitter, re recognize, realize, I have an opportunity to take my next step in faith. I know it's painful, it's just like when we see our kids growing, you know, there's groaning with growing often. There's discomfort. And it takes a lot of maturity as a follower of Jesus to be going through something difficult and first of all say, I trust that God's always good. I trust that the evil in this world is not from him, it's from Satan. I'm going to cry out to him. I'm going to submit to him even when it doesn't make sense. And I'm also going to humble myself before the Lord enough to say, well, Father God, if you're allowing me to go through this, there must be some way for me to grow. So don't waste your pain. Don't waste your opportunity to grow within the difficulty. God tested the Israelites, and there will be times when he tests us. One of these tests uh, in my life was five months ago in August. Many of you were here, but I'll summarize if you weren't here or maybe you've forgotten um, I, I've had some neurological brain health issues really since my childhood. And a few years ago, I had this random thing that was actually in my inner ear called vestibular neuritis, and it's like ongoing vertigo, and you struggle to stand up and to balance. You can't drive, which is one of my favorite things in the world to do, to drive. And God carried me through vestibular neuritis four or five years ago. But this last August... We had seen God do some miracles here in our church in the months leading up. He provided a building over in Carmel where we had been praying. He provided the funds to remodel the building. And I'd been away with my family for some of July, and I was so excited to get back in August and just like, let's go, church. And literally the next morning that we got back from our trip, um, my wife and I woke up driving to the gym to go work out, trying to take care of our bodies. 
and, and my head just starts falling to the right, like it used to do when I had vestibular neuritis. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. It got to the point where I actually, um, I haven't shared this before. <laughs> uh, I think only our elders know this and my, my three executive pastors. I, I gathered my executive pastors in a room. I said, guys, it, it was like week two or three that it was just getting worse and worse. I said, guys, I, I might be disabled for a while. And, and if that happens, here's what we do. You know, the vision doesn't change. The elders are great and they're solid. Pastor Ron can teach. And like this vision, just fulfill that vision with or without me. It was so emotional to say. Within that time, we had our first night of worship over at Carmel. And on that night, I, I couldn't drive over there. Mel had to drive me. I was so sick to my stomach by the time we got there just from the movement of the car. But just in my spirit, I was like, I'm not going to miss our first night of worship dedicating this new property. So I sat in the front row, and during worship, everyone's standing and hands are raised. I'm just sitting there, and there's just tears because I'm like, God, I, I know you're doing miracles. I know you've provided this building. I know you're at work, but I can't even stand up right now. Like, what's going on? When it was time for me to kind of speak I just hobbled the, about eight feet from the front row there to the stage, and I just sat on the edge of the stage with my eyes closed and just kind of declared God's faithfulness. I already knew two of the best experts in the state of Indiana for balance issues because of my previous bout with it. But as we're there, and as Carmel dismisses, and I'm sitting there, and a few people came up and prayed for me, but I'm literally just like about to throw up, um, this woman who my wife and I have never met before, doesn't attend Brownsburg, she lives in Carmel, someone from the Carmel Go team invited her, she was sitting right behind my wife and me during worship, and she comes up to Mel, my wife, at the end, and she says, hey, my husband had a really similar thing for years. And it was so discouraging. It was so debilitating. And we saw all these different experts and nothing helped. And then we went to this doctor and she gives us the name. And he diagnosed it as a vestibular migraine. It's actually a, a it, it could be if it's this. It's, it's actually a form of a migraine. Um, so you should see this doctor. Well, I mean, me of little faith, We've been told millions of things, not millions, lots of things by lots of people, right? And we've tried them all. But we add this doctor to our list, doctor number three. So we go to doctor number one, the expert in the state of Indiana. He says, no, it's nothing with your brain. It's just your you know, inner ear. I'm going to do these maneuvers. You'll be better in 24 hours. 36 hours later, still about to throw up all the time. Still can't drive. Go to the second expert. Same thing. Well, let's go to this third doctor from the person we didn't even know who was at the night of worship and gave us the name. He says, do you have a history with migraine? Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's like, hemiplegic migraines, stroke-like symptoms. He's like, oh, wow, that's a very complex migraine. I can almost guarantee you have vestibular migraine happening. You probably have the inner ear stuff as well that the other doctors said. You have two or three things going on. They're not wrong, but let's try this prescription and let's see if it doesn't help. And if it does help, it'll let us know you had vestibular migraine. Within about a week of taking that medication, I could drive again. I could walk better. Within a month of taking it, I was about 95% back to normal. And, you know, Yahweh Rapha, the God who heals, he does show up. He shows up through modern medicine. He shows up through a believer you've never met before who's sitting behind you during worship. Who says, hey, I just felt prompted to tell you something. I don't call that meeting with that dear sister in the Lord a coincidence. I call it a miracle. And here's the thing. I would have missed that miracle if... In the bitterness of what was happening, I said, I, I just can't go. I can't go worship God right now. I'm too discouraged. I would have missed it. I wouldn't have been there to receive it. The pot of water wouldn't have been filled up to be turned into wine. And so the sixth thing to do when your life is bitter, you're doing it right now. Keep worshiping. No matter how bitter it gets, keep worshiping. 
Keep gathering with the believers and keep serving. Because you never know when you're serving the believers who are walking in with buried bitterness that you can't even imagine. And because you showed up to hold the door or to run the video camera or to serve in Kid City or to help in the parking lot, because you were there serving, they are able to step into the miracle of what God wants to do in their life. Maybe healing them emotionally, relationally, spiritually, maybe even physically. I don't know if you've ever had tears in your eyes during worship, where the song and what it's about and God's goodness just either it overcomes you in a good way or just with everything you have, you're saying, God, I'm just choosing to believe that even though I don't feel it. Can I just say, I'm so glad that those people who have the spiritual gift of worship, those musicians, and those technicians who enable us to hear it and experience it. I'm so glad they show up every week, whether their life is bitter or sweet. I'm so glad that, that each of you show up every week, and it ministers to me, it ministers to one another. I wonder who in your life is passing through some bitter waters right now, and they just need you to serve them, to love them, to be the body of Christ to them. And I also just want to encourage you Every weekend here, God is using you to minister to people who are going through bitter things. Seventh thing, when your life is as bitter as vinegar, look to the cross of Christ. Look to the cross of Christ. Exodus, the Lord showed Moses a piece of tree. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. I want you to envision human history as murky, oily, polluted waters. Stretches as far as you can see. The waters of human history are broken by evil. There are soldiers who are amputees because of war. There's parts of the earth where blood soaks the soil in Ukraine and in the Middle East. There are children who are abused. There are children with cancer. There are boys without dads, there's physical abuse. Envision the bitter waters into which we were all born, full of pollution and debris and disease, oily with slander and deception, people snatching things from weaker people, people lying to one another, people physically harming one another, middle school girls being mocked in front of their classmates, vulnerable widows being taken advantage of, dying grandparents surrounded by loving kids and grandkids who don't want to say goodbye, but death doesn't give them a choice. Every parent and every child separated, every marriage that fails, it's all in these murky, bitter, oily waters, including whatever bitter thing is in your life right now. There's one piece of wood cast into the waters of humanity that has the power to turn all of this evil into something good for those who will simply drink of the living water. It's the cross of Christ that makes bitter things sweet. It's part of what God was foreshadowing 1,500 years before Christ with that story. Galatians 3 puts it this way, Christ redeemed us from the curse. The world we live in is cursed. It is broken. Our attempts to reach God by being better, working harder, always fail because of that curse. But God became that curse for us. He jumped into this oily, murky, nasty water. Because it's written in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, Cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. Same Hebrew word as what Moses threw into that water. Another prediction of what the Messiah would do. He'd be hanged on a tree for us. God on earth, not a metaphor. Here are some actual Roman nails from the era in which Jesus lived. And I want you to see these to grasp that this story of God intentionally becoming human like you and me, stepping down into our mess, 
being separated from heaven for 30 some years, willingly going to this wooden hand carved torture device, allowing himself to be physically nailed and impaled onto that device so that he could absorb the consequences of our sin. He who should never have to taste bitter took all that is bitter in our lives upon himself. And it brings a lot of significance to this moment when Jesus is hanging on the cross in John chapter 19. And everything that has been promised by the prophets he has fulfilled, he's about to gasp his final breath. And what does he say? I'm thirsty. You know that the God who made you, the God who wants to help you, He's not distant. He's not absent. He knows what you feel. He knows what it is to thirst for a partner. He knows what it is to thirst for love, to thirst for justice, to thirst for deliverance from physical suffering. He thirsted. What do they give him? A jar of vinegar. They lift the vinegar up to his lips. Almighty God, the only force in the universe that can turn bitter things sweet willingly at his weakest. He's physically emaciated. He's bleeding to death. His lungs are giving out. His back is all ripped up. He's dying, and he cries out for water. And what does he get? Bitter. When he had received that bitter drink. You know these words, but maybe you hadn't realized the significance of the context. He said, it is finished. And with that, his spirit left his body. He knows your pain. Thankfully, the story doesn't end there. The same God rose from the dead three days later, proving that no matter what bitter thing you taste in this life, including the bitterness of death, which physically will all pass through, he has sweetness on the other side. He has resurrection on the other side. And that was also true in this foreshadowing story from 1,500 years before Jesus. You see, after the Israelites were there at that place they named Mara, the Hebrew word for bitter, God then leads them, if you read all of Exodus 15, to a place called Elam, which is about the opposite. There are 12 springs, one for every one of the tribes. And there are 70 palm trees. This is like an oasis. And it's also a picture. Because in the era that we live in, the slavery we're under is not to Egypt, it's to sin. It's to ourself and our broken choices. And the Red Sea that we pass through is after we believe in Jesus and we pass through the waters a baptism, as many will today, and we publicly declare, I am following Jesus with my feet and with my life. And after you follow Jesus, there will still be bitter things in your life. But your story won't end there. Elam, these 12 springs, these 70 palm trees, is a picture of kingdom come. It's where we're all going to be in 100 years if you've believed in Jesus, if you've placed your faith in him. A place where there's no sickness, no disease, No cancer, no hospitals, no cemeteries, no courts, (laughs) no crime. And I'd never noticed it until studying this passage from Exodus and following that thread through the crucifixion that when the new heaven and new earth where we will physically be with Jesus is described, guess what's there, Revelation 22, the river of the water of life. Clear as crystal living water, perfect water, sweet water, flowing from the throne of him who was and is and will forever be the Alpha and Omega, the only God who can create and recreate and redeem. And that river is going to flow down the middle of the street of this great tangible city that we will live in with God. And guess what is on each side of the river? Tree tree of life, similar to the one that Adam and Eve messed up. How many crops does it bear? Twelve. 
and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. You'll look around that city. You'll see Jewish people. You'll see Arab people. You'll see Chinese and Korean and Russian and European. You'll see Christians who lost their lives in Roman Colosseums, who were fed to lions in this world, but will live eternally in that world. You'll see Christians from the Soviet Union who were marched out into the snow to die in the Soviet gulags. And you'll see your family members, the people in this church family that you know and love who've trusted in Christ. Let me pray this for you now. Father, I want to thank you that you are Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals. God, I pray your healing for every person online, for every person over at Avon, for every person in Fishers and here at Brownsburg. Oh God, you see our wounds. You see the bitter things in our lives. Oh, how we need you. We need you to heal our bodies. We need you to heal our faith. We need you to heal our minds, our souls, our relationships. Yahweh Rapha, heal our emotions. We cry out to you and we submit to you. We've tasted and seen that you're good and God, be faithful for every person crying out to you in faith right now that they would taste and see once again that you turn bitter things sweet. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you want to stand with me, it is Baptism Sunday. And uh, if you've not been here before for Baptism Sunday, you're going to hear some raucous cheering. Uh, And this is because baptism is a step of obedience, but it's also a symbol. It's a picture of dying to our old selfish way of life and being raised into eternal life, freedom from sin, adoption into the family of God. So if you've never taken this step, as you watch these, Decide, I'm going to take that step. Uh, We can help you with that for our next baptism weekend, but let's worship and let's celebrate new life through Christ.
what God is doing in this place. Come on, let's sing. The name above the battle. The undefeated Savior stands with me. The fighter for the If you say it, you 
celebrate with our dear brothers and sisters. Well, hey, if you are new here, we would love to give you a gift. We have that gift out at the Next Steps corner right outside these doors. We would love to meet you and give you that gift. We love you guys, and thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Have a great week. We'll see you next weekend.